We're here, planted on our fourth Sunday, I think, about the Because It Matters theme, a theme that we have chosen to focus our fundraising and fund development program on this year, uh, which is kind of an odd way of putting it because we actually never have a fundraising program, so we have decided to have one this year, and that's what we're calling it. So we've looked at a number of different things that have mattered, and today I want to talk about staying connected and how we stay connected and we talk talk about that because it matters. I'm going to start first not talking about the river that Zen master Suzuki Roshi talked about, but talking about that process of being born and what it does for us as, as adults, what it has done our being born so long ago. There are a number of theories about that, uh, what happens during the birth process and how it affects us as we grow and develop. That if our birth process is traumatic, it can lead to psychological challenges down the road as well as the uh, physical ones which are manifest as well. But that also if it is a cesarean birth, that the challenges that may take place because the child has not had that experience of compression uh, during the birth process, that, that that child too may have a number of challenges related to that uh, birthing experience that are very different from those that have a regular natural childbirth. And different again between those that started in a natural childbirth process, uh, entered into the birth canal, experienced some of that, uh, the uh, contractions and the being stuffed into that uh, space, which of course opens for it, uh, and the difference between that and those who are in a scheduled cesarean birth where there is no trauma, no emergency situation, uh, but the child is just surgically removed from the mother's womb. And that those two experiences and the experience of a natural childbirth uh, where the, the child is born vaginally, that they have a dramatic difference on what the child is like. Some theories uh, have been put forward and studies done to show that children that uh, have pl participate in games related to rebirth, or uh, going through that birth process again, that they experience the process psychologically, that they connect with some of those memories that of course we never think we would able, be able to get close to, but they connect to those memories and so process them in a way that is positive and helpful for the child if it's done early, early on. They are things like creating a, a bridge, the parents creating a bridge that the child can uh, make their way through or doing a massage, head and neck and shoulder massage that sort of replaces that sense of uh, compression that an infant would feel as they're being born. And some studies show that children that have been born uh, through a, a cesarean that has been uh, brought on in a traumatic experience in the midst of a regular uh, expected, regularly expected birth, that they'll, they won't actually go for the bridge thing right away. They'll play around it and they'll, they'll avoid it and eventually they find that they can go through it and that this is psychologically helpful uh, for the child. But we all end up here. We've all ended up here. Whether we were born by cesarean, by uh, cesarean that happened partway through a normal birth, or whether uh, through a normal birth, birth situation, we all end up here. And we all end up in the arms of someone who is supposed to care for us. The person that's best for our care isn't the mom or the dad, necessarily. It's the good enough caregiver. The good enough caregiver could be an aunt, could be a, an adopted parent, could be the mom or the dad. But it's the person who in the life of the infant provides everything that infant needs as long as the infant can't actually begin to get it themselves. So the good enough caregiver will provide what the infant needs until he or she recognizes that the child could actually do something for themselves and then they step back and let them master that little bit of autonomy. Some of the theories around this are so strong that they believe that even if the mother places her nipple in the baby's mouth, that that has reduced the sense of autonomy that a newborn has, and that a newborn left to lie on the mother's chest will eventually find the nipple him or herself. And that that moment of autonomy that that happens can make a, an incredible difference in a child's life. Having the good enough parent around or the good enough caregiver around 
leads to a sense of confidence, a sense of security as the infant experiences what can only be an amazingly confusing world. Unless there's stuff that goes on before birth that we haven't figured out yet. That, you know, they haven't cased out the house. They don't know where the other kids sleep. They don't know what those noises are. If they haven't done that pre-birth, then it must be a very strange world indeed. Noise is happening from all over the place. Stuff you can't focus on happening in front of your eyes. Light and dark and light and dark again. Trying to figure it all out could be overwhelming. But with that good enough caregiver around to to console and to make safe and to offer that security to the child, there's a confidence that grows. And that sense of security is manifest not only in the infant and in the toddler and in the kid on their first day at school, but in you and I, adults, through our lives. John Bowlby in the 1960s uh, believed that those first relationships, that first good enough parenting, I don't even know if it was called that at that time, but that first relationship between parent and child or caregiver and child was the most important thing. And that if there wasn't a secure attachment made at that point in time, that things would fall apart later on. That there would be some kind of pathologies that would develop within the child that didn't allow them to experience their own autonomy in a way that gave them confidence and allowed them to be secure. He was ridiculed by his peers who thought that that was a wacko idea. But eventually Mary Ainsley did some studies with young children and found that there were at, th at least three attachment uh, ways. It was called the stranger situation. A child would be in a room with, uh, with his or her parent. They'd be between 12 and 18 months old. And a stranger would come in the room and converse with the parent, talk to the parent for a little while, and then interact with the child a little bit, and the parent would leave the room. The child would then display a variety of different behaviors, uh, showing distress or not noticing or interacting with the, with the stranger or not interacting with the stranger, and then the parent would come back in and the child would interact again in certain ways. And through analysis of those different ways that the child reacted, Mary Ainsley came up with three different kinds of attachment. Secure attachment, where the child would show some distress when the mother left the room, but when the mother came back into the room, would show, would again reconnect with the mother or the father, uh, would again reconnect with that parent in a way that seemed to be fairly normal. Or that's what she was looking for. There was an insecure attachment where the, pa the parent left the room, the child would have like this uh, increasingly distressed experience, and when the parent came back in the room, would perhaps not even respond to the parent at all. The ambivalent child would ignore the parent that the parent had left, yet perhaps when the parent came back in, uh, maybe slap the parent or be angry with the parent. We've all seen this kind of behavior happen with our nieces and nephews and our own children. And it's all related back to this idea of an attachment theory. Fast forward that to all of us as adults. And we can see that we live it out in our own lives. John Bowlby's work has been picked up by Sue Johnson, who wrote a book on attachment in relationship, emotionally focused therapy, it's called, uh, the, her process is called. And it looks at the big issues that end up in counseling sessions when couples have come in to have a conversation with a counselor because something's going wrong in their marriage. And Sue Johnson, after years and years and years of watching these same arguments happen in, oh yeah, I recognize that one again, over and over and over decided that this attachment theory that she had been following with John Bowlby had a lot to do with what was showing up in her office. That one person was often attached in an over-attached way and one was attached in an under-attached way. So when the one in the under-attached way uh, got upset about something, they would withdraw. Of course, the one who wanted to attach pursued them because they want the pursuit. Then the underattached feels completely overwhelmed and, the other, and runs away. And the other one feels totally abandoned. And it goes on and on and on. So Sue Johnson has developed this uh, process of doing therapy to help heal some of that. We come together in this place today to talk about connections. Whether we connect as securely as perhaps we might had everything been perfect when we were born as children, 
or whether our attachment styles vary grossly from those of the ones that we are in relationship with or the people that we work with or whoever we interact with on a daily basis. And so it is hard for us to interact in ways that we want to. We are all impacted by those early days. And those styles of attachment will walk with us through the whole of our lives. You'll remember when I was ill last year, and I didn't want to see anyone in the congregation. I totally withdrew. You'll never guess what my attachment style is. It's pretty obvious. I want to withdraw, take care of myself. I, I attach loosely, if at all. Scott connects in a significant way. So our attachment styles aren't necessarily tuned to each other, and we work through that on a regular basis, recognizing that those kinds of styles it will impact us positively or negatively, and we get to choose how they do. So we work through it. But in this kind of community, when we come together and we seek to offer of ourselves into the community so that we can grow, so that we can stretch, so that we can strengthen those bonds that we are in need of strengthening, for those times when our lives kind of fall apart and we've got nothing to hang on to but those people that we know love us, those attachment theories can be partly in the background because we're not as significantly connected uh, in this place as we are in a one-on-one -on -one relationship or a relationship with our child or our parents. We're here, we can play with relationships, we can try out new things, we can offer the kind of closeness that we feel is comfortable and see how it's responded to. Or we can hold back and see if, that, if we're given permission to do that. And I think that we've created space here that allows us to do both of those things. To be connected and to be engaged, to come out every week a couple of times to be together as a group or to offer to be here on a Sunday morning to be present to someone we may never have met before. The opportunity to engage in this place is an opportunity that supports us and allows us to see and test our own engagement styles, our own attachment styles, so that we can process them perhaps a little better elsewhere. You may have heard that there's a whole lot of uh, atheist communities uh, being launched by Sanderson Jones and Pippa Evans there on a, on a world tour planting congregations around the world, primarily in North America. But I read online that there's one starting in Scotland too. And the one in Scotland has come under some critique by the atheist community, as I'm sure the other ones will too. Atheists who feel that to gather together in churches, to gather together in congregations, is picking up on that old stuff of religion that's not a good thing, that we shouldn't be mimicking those things that have been so unhelpful for the world. That communities that gather together that are religious, let them have it, but atheists don't do that. It's not a good choice. I argue with that. I don't think that's good at all. Because I think that the connections that we make in these kind of communities are essential. The connections that we make aren't doctrinally based when they're made in communities of free thinkers or secular humanists or people that don't want to be labeled at all. If they're gathering together based on the kind of things like we talk about when we, when we reiterate uh, the words of commitment, when we say them again each and every week, if they're based on those kinds of values, then I can't imagine anything that would be negative for our world that would come out of a community based on that. And so I'm fearful for the atheist community that consistently, as I say, wants to eat its young. They're constantly at one another uh, and that opportunity to come together to create community, to speak about values, to test out things like attachment styles and figure out how they can be positive in your life and how your relationships can be better as a result of them. I think those things are really, really important. And so I celebrate who we are. And that's why this place is one of those things that we do because it matters. Because we are an example of people who come together, not around religious doctrine, but because it's important for us to practice loving one another, to practice being tolerant of one another's opinions even when we don't agree with them, to practice being in conversation about those things we don't agree, and to test 
our own ideas against the ones that are offered to us by others. That's a healthy, wholesome thing to do. Today is a Sunday that is known throughout, uh, around the world as Worldwide Communion Sunday. It's an opportunity for communities, Christian communities, to gather together and be about that thing called communion. It goes way, way back, most of you know the story, back to that meal that Jesus is purported to have had with his group of disciples. A meal in which he would have known, perhaps understood, that there was going to be something big happening the next day, and it might not be good. So he gathered together those people that were important to him. He wanted to remember the people whose faces he had loved so deeply, so intently. Each one of you has a table you've been at that you can recall to your mind now that was surrounded by people that you loved intimately, whose lives meant more to you than your own, whose stories made your day, whose possibilities and hopes were things that you wished for them that they might achieve them. Around those tables with those people, your lives are changed because you're exposed to that thing called love and all the challenge and the trepidation that it lays before you. That table, whether or not it was really sat around or not, that one way back in the beginning of the Christian story, that table, if it had anything like the love around the tables that I'm talking about to you, the tables that you know and you can recall, it would have been a profound moment. We choose to make profound moments so that we can be changed so that we can be exposed to that radical thing called love. So we can hear the stories of those who gather with us and we can be altered by them. They can shift the way we see the world. They can touch us deeply and challenge us to see it differently. And then they can trust that when we hold that story, we'll do it with respect, with love, and that even if it hurts us in the telling, we'll be able to hold and forgive and love together into the future. When we come to this place to have that meal together, we do it probably far more like what it was celebrated like way back in the early church. When people would come together and set the table, cover it with food, so that anyone and everyone, provided they had labored somewhere in the community, or were able to and did, that they came and participated and knew that they were part of that community. Those who were wealthy brought a little bit more and those who had nothing brought themselves. But it wove together communities that inspire us yet. So whether we stay here in a mainline denomination and continue doing this stuff, or whether communities in Scotland start growing around the idea of atheism, the centrality of a table, of sitting around it together, of being vulnerable to one another, those are the things that this table is about. Each and every one of you, at some point in time, will need to hold your hand out. You'll need to hold it out because you need help, because you need support, because there's nothing else in your life that you can trust, so you reach out for that somewhere beyond you. Or you may have reached it out because someone else needed your hand. Someone else needed that support, needed the possibility of strength that they couldn't find in themselves. Let's make that possible at this table today as we come together and share a meal, galvanizing everything that has ever been good that has come out of the tables before. <laughs>